when we speak of sex and then gender and development, we begin with the understanding that gender and sexuality are fundamental structuring aspects of human life, which determine life chances, access to public goods, distribution of resources. And feminist economists have long demonstrated that when we apply the lenses of gender and sexuality, then we have to fundamentally alter how we think about development. So for example, if we think of feminist critiques of structural adjustment policies that have showed the ways in which gender inequalities, but also heterosexist um, understandings and framings of, of society draw on women's unpaid labor and women's unpaid social reproductive work, required women to respond as shock absorbers to crisis, but that they also produced unequal relations of gendered power. So understanding how policies may draw on unequal relations of gender, but how also they are productive of those unequal relations of gender as well. And so thinking of the work of Caribbean feminist scholar Michelle Rowley, who does a lot of work on gender and development as well, I wanted to assert that at this particular moment, sexing and gendering development requires a transnational feminist praxis, hence the value of the regions refocus cross-regional dialogue in which the salient analytical markers must be determined by the fields of play in which power reveals itself. So in other words, I'm talking about the ways in which the valences of power are multiple and contextual and how we have to be attentive to these. So what does this mean for development policy and for a feminist critique of development and also a queer critique of development? So it means that north-south power relations are also important configurations in terms of understanding power based on gender and sexuality. It also means that when unequal relations of power between international financial institutions and Caribbean governments cannibalize policy space, that this is also has to be seen as part of the structuring of vulnerability of women, of young people, and also of LGBT people. It means that sexuality needs to enter development, not just in relation to violence, in relation to crisis, and in relation to disease, even though these are important questions, but also in relation to access to work and access to education. So returning to this question of being attentive to multiple valences of power also requires an insistence on harnessing long-term planning for economic justice. So for example, Caribbean feminists have asserted that there needs to be counter-cyclical planning, which permits governments to engage in a longer term planning and not just be responding to eventualities and crises with social welfare policies, for example. And this sexing and gendering of development also means we have to push back against the instrumentalization of women in development policy which is also, I would argue, the dehumanization of women. So when we say invest in women because it makes good business sense, or invest in women as a way to ensure positive outcomes for children, for example, is deeply pro problematic. And you know, doing work around ICPD with colleagues across ca the Caribbean and also Latin America, I remember someone sharing that there was a minister who was like really outraged at the high rate of maternal mortality. And he's quoted as saying, you know, we can't have women dying in childbirth because after all, women give birth to men. So, right? so, I, so I hope you understand you know, what, what I mean when I talk about this instrumentalization of women as a dehumanization of women and what this means in particular for sexual and reproductive health and rights. So I just want to close by reiterating that feminist intervention into development policies requires heightened analysis and attention to the multiple valences of power. We need to extend our analytical resources across the range of issues that we we're talking about that I haven't had time to, to touch on. So extractivism in our regions, climate change and climate financing, particularly important for the Caribbean. And we have to ensure that our policies do not depend on unequal relations of gender in order to be quote unquote successful, but also that they do not produce more inequality. And that's where I want to end. Thank you so much. I looked at it from the position of, instead of seeing sex and gender as inherently structuring, I, I see them rather as social variables within um, a, a development paradigm.
which ultimately shape the, cit the citizen's subject and um, ultimately also define, therefore, their access to, their movement through, or their ultimate exclusion from that kind of de development system. So to me, when we're saying that we need to have a, a queer approach or consider sec sexuality and gender in the way we approach development, it's not about uh, what are the implications for LGBT people or for women of a certain class, etc. It's the broader question of how we understand political economy itself, how we understand development itself. It's about the lens through which we, we, uh, we frame the very problem of development and in today's context, sustainable development. In the framework of financing for development, I think all this debate is really, really important because even if for some of us it's like an old record, we need to keep <laughs> keep explaining why gender power relations are embedded in economic processes because women and men, for instance, in, in its diversity of sexualities, of race, of ages, experience impacts of different um, economic trends and, and globalization trends like financialization of, of the economy or uh, trade liberalization as their different roles they have as a consequence of this gender order, order as consumers, as workforce, as producers, but also as responsible for the activities of the care work inside the household and outside. So we need to challenge this reduction of women's economic rights to women empowerment, and that's what we have in the goals. We don't have women's rights, we have women empowerment. And we have a promotion of specific agendas, such as women access to ITC, to credit. So this issue of, okay, we, we include women because we are doing financial inclusion, it's already um, raised and, and, and it's there in the elements paper of the FFT conference that it's coming now. So for us, we really need to move and to overcome this false dichotomy between uh, human rights versus development, which we have been hearing in, the, in these global spaces, because we, we, we say that we cannot, we cannot have development without human rights, but we cannot have human rights, at least from the South, without development or without removing the development obstacles we have at the global level. And so when we have her in these negotiations at the, with the um, sustainable development goals, some governments from the South saying, we cannot eat rights. We need investment to lift people out of poverty. For women, women cannot eat without rights, without a human rights, without a state where we can hold accountable for overcome structural inequalities. The Caribbean as a region has the second highest HIV AIDS prevalence rates. Um, governments understand this fundamentally as a development issue in relation to its impact on the labor force, um, but also in relation to the, to the very real cost of treatment, particularly in the face of international funding streams for, for treatment becoming more and more, and more um, diminished. And so governments have been sort of trying to, to put things in place policy-wise to address the, the particular problem. But we also have uh, another reality in the Caribbean, which is that LGBTI people are discriminated against. They face significant levels of stigma and discrimination. So what that has ultimately um, translated into is a reality whereby within MSM communities particularly, men, men who have sex with men, and they, they, they are higher HIV AIDS prevalence rates within, within that, that particular community. And that coupled with the fact that given the stigma and discrimination, uh, many LGBTI people have to perform heteronormativity allows for HIV AIDS to sort of transfer between communities. And, and so governments, in my view, are shooting themselves in, in the foot when they implement policies which ignore that reality. So I want to pitch to the, 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 the policy makers in the room and, and really reaffirm the point that it, it is important to ask ourselves what assumptions are we making? Because development has a particular shape and ultimately we have to ask ourselves, is it shaped in a way that allows ease of movement through for all citizens? Are we excluding any particular person? And, and what is the effect of, of that particular exclusion? We, we need to understand localized forms of sexuality, sexualness and gender articulation. Uh, and that's one of the, the, the crucial problems uh, when we're talking about the geopolitics of, uh, of sexuality and, and development where uh, the approach to the question of sexuality is already framed in terms of 
LGBT rights, and now we're talking about same-sex marriage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Stuff that is completely, you know, irrelevant to the political uh, p political frame. So there's a lot of work to be done in that context, and it's I think it's very important to point to uh, to to the need for uh, not not simply an indigenous language of politics. Uh, but rather new, if you're talking about the transnational, you're talking about the international, it's, it's I mean, there, there's similar kinds of phenomena in most parts of the global south. But those conversations get subsumed under this LGBTIQ kind of, kind of thing. And that is a new form of imperialism, that sexuality in the entire world is simply a variation of the way it's been recognized in Europe and North America. You know, that, that is, the, is the challenge. So it's not simply about local indigenous. It's about changing the ways in which sexuality and gender are appreciated uh, the, the world over. I think. As you all know, Pacific is a very small region within this world and our issues are a little bit different. And just recently, you know, we were able to have a initiative, the Pacific Partnership on Gender, Climate Change and Sustainable Development. And um, we focus on the gender and the impact of climate change on gender. And this is something um, we in the Pacific, because, you know, we are We'll, we'll be the first one to be affected by the rising of this, uh, the sea rise level. Just recently before I came, um, there was another king tides that hit the islands, and um, there were people that were dislocated from their homes, and most of them were women, uh, women with the children, and they were not prepared you know, for this uh, climate change effect. And another issue is that um, rise up it's the reproductive uh, health rights. It's um, in the Pacific, um, teen pregnancy is still high, especially from the country, small country I came from, Marshall Islands. And we have came to find out that although we have all these uh, reproductive um, birth controls and things, you know, they, it hasn't gone out to the um, other islands and they don't understand. And what happened, it's really affecting the lives of the young. I think we are at a very dangerous point where uh, there is the return to population control. And that is happening primarily through climate change discourse. So you've got this entire ridiculous idea of population offset, right? which is that uh, you know, co corporations or governments can invest in the, the control of fertility of women uh, in the global south. Then there'll be a calculation of how many kids, how many brown and black kids have been prevented from being born. And on that basis, you can, you can off offset and emit that much carbon. And I'm trying to work this through an idea of bioavailability, that there's ways in which bodies in the global south are brought into the calculations of capital. And I think uh, the question of reproductive rights, reproductive justice, is, is very central to, uh, to these processes. So this coming together, especially the fact that this is sustainable development goals and side of planetary boundaries, et cetera, et cetera, the burden of that is going to be faced by women in the global south. There's no getting away from that. And that is why this is a very, very uh, significant point to be, to be taken up in, uh, you know, in the post-2015 uh, agenda, et cetera.